In previous lessons, we've learned about the face area in the right fusiform gyrus that seems to selectively respond to faces. Activity is correlated to the conscious perception of faces. Now, faces are an observable feature of a person. But, of course, behind every face is a mind that is animating that face. And by mind, we mean uh, a set of mental states like beliefs and desires and intentions. Now, these things are not observable directly. We have to infer uh, somebody's mental states. Well, in this lesson, then, we'll look at how uh, functional neuroimaging has been used to reveal uh, those parts of our brain that seem to be involved in mentalizing what is called theory of mind. Uh, do we have a dedicated brain system uh, responsible for helping us understand the mental states of other people? And we'll focus on the, the work of uh, Rebecca Sachs and her colleagues. So a quick definition, theory of mind refers to the processes by which most healthy human adults, one, attribute unobservable mental states to others, and sometimes to the self, unobservable mental states, right? So these are things like beliefs, desires, intentions. And two, integrate these attributed states into a single coherent model that can be used to explain and predict the target's behavior and experiences. And this part gets to the value of having the system. It'll, it will allow us to explain behavior and predict behavior. Very useful. For example, you know, why would mom eat broccoli when there's chocolate cake available? Well, you know, she has a different mind with different preferences, and maybe different beliefs about the long-term value associated with eating these two things. Why would mom look for the milk in the refrigerator when dad already put it on the table? Well, because she doesn't know that dad did that. She has a false belief that the milk is still in the refrigerator. So understanding that minds can be host to beliefs that are different from one's own and from reality is very useful capacity, and it's called a theory of mind. Now, early research in theory of mind used a, 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 a task like this. It's called a false belief task, and I'll describe this um, briefly here. So here's Sally, and Sally has a basket, and Anne has a box. Aren't they lucky? So S Sally has a marble, right, her favorite marble. She's going to put it in her basket, and Anne is just watching. Now Sally goes out for a walk, and Anne gets the bright idea. She's going to move the marble <coughs> from the uh, basket to the box. <clears throat> now, Sally comes back, and uh, we can ask a question, where will Sally look for her marble, right? Well, we, the observers, know the marble is in the box, but if we have a theory of mind, we will understand that Sally has a false belief. She falsely believes that the marble is still in the basket where she left it. So having a, a theory of mind will allow us to predict that she will look in the basket even though we know that the marble is in the box. Now, the ability to uh, think about other people's thoughts and beliefs has a developmental progression. So typical three-year-olds don't pass the Sally Ann false belief task. They make the wrong prediction about where Sally will look. Three-year-olds think that Sally will look in the box where the marble really is. They don't seem to understand that she's having a false belief, and that false belief will be influencing her behavior. Now, it's not that children are confused. They're, they don't really seem confused. They're very confident in their predictions. It's just the predictions is not, is not the one that adults would make. Uh, they have a different sort of theory about what's driving uh, behavior. They don't seem to be able to understand that the character has a false belief. And if we take the, the case of the milk being moved from the refrigerator, you know, three-year-olds, they will often fabricate uh, very passionately held explanations for why the characters are looking in the refrigerator. So they might say, well, see, Mom no longer wants the milk, right? Uh, and she's maybe looking for something else. By five-year-old, um, children are successful. So they can understand that uh, another might have a false belief about the world and that these false beliefs can influence behavior. Um, this developmental progression has been found all over the world in all cultures so far studied. Uh, so children naturally uh, move from a three-year-old uh, situation where they don't understand the false belief task to five-year-old where they do. And interestingly, there is though one exception to the rule, and that is children with autism spectrum disorder they seem to have difficulty uh, um, on tasks like this. Now, it is true that, that 
that some can later on uh, pass these types of tasks, and we'll we'll try to explain that uh, when we get to autism. Uh, but this initially suggested to researchers that perhaps if if a disorder like autism could knock out this capacity for mentalizing, maybe mentalizing might have a, a specialized system in the brain that is affected by this disease. So it's sort of like Canwisher's argument that uh, early researchers thought there was a face area because there were patients with local brain damage that lost face recognition ability. Similarly here, autism, if, if it could wipe out, uh, you know, mentalizing capacities, perhaps uh, there is some special system in the brain. So that's the hypothesis that early researchers embraced, that there is a special system in the brain that supports theory of mind reasoning. Now, earlier we learned that the fusiform face area is just one, one part of the visual system, and it gets inputs from the early visual areas and then sends outputs uh, to other parts of the brain. We're going to uh, use that same model here uh, to think about the uh, mentalizing regions of the brain. Now, one of them we've already uh, seen before is called the temporoparietal junction, and it is uh, activated when subjects are thinking about other people's thoughts, and it, too, will have a set of inputs and a set of outputs. Now, one of the inputs we suggested earlier was perhaps from those regions of the brain that are processing the dynamic aspects of the faces. So fusiform is going to process sort of the uh, identity of the face, and then the superior temporal sulcus face area here may be processing emotional expressions, eye gaze, things like that. And we said that this might be one source of input to the, the TPJ here, and that makes sense because um, uh, you know, the emotional expression or their eye gaze would be useful information for computing what it is they're thinking about or what their desires are or what uh, their intentions might be. But it's not the only set of inputs, right? Because, after all, as we'll see, the fMRI studies often use verbal material to uh, get people to think about others' thoughts. So clearly, the language systems uh, are, can be a source of input to this region. So let's get to some of the fMRI studies that reveal that this area here, and some others, but we'll focus on the TPJ here, is a, a region of the brain that seems specialized for thinking about another person's thoughts. Well, you recall that when you do fMRI studies, you need to have a contrast. You have to do the subtraction method. So you'll want to have some kind of target stimulation, uh, some whatever scenario th that you're really interested in, but then you're going to want to subtract all the brain activity that's not really related to the, the uh, processing of interest, and you'll need, so you'll have to have a control task. Well, if we use the false belief task as our target stimulation, that's the target condition, we're going to want to subtract all the brain activity that is kind of being used here, but it's not really related to processing someone's thoughts. Uh, so we need a control task, and often what's used is called the picture task. Now, the picture task has uh, some similar features to the uh, false belief task over here. Well, here we see a person taking a photograph of a scene. The cat is on the... Uh, chair, and now here comes the picture. It's like a Polaroid, right? So the picture captured this scene, but now the person's going to move the cat from the chair to the bed, and then we can ask in the photograph, where's the cat? See, right now, the photograph doesn't capture the current state of reality. We could say it's a false photograph. So something has changed in the world, and the picture no longer represents uh, the world. Well, that has a similar structure to the false belief task here. Something changed in the world. The marble was moved from the basket to the box, right? And over here, though, we're interested in the beliefs of Sally here versus uh, the picture over here in the picture task. So when you subtract the brain activity for the picture task from the brain activity f uh, in the false belief task, what we should get then are those areas of the brain that are specifically activated when processing somebody's thoughts about a situation. Okay, so here are the results of uh, one kind of experiment like this. So we'll have the belief condition and the photo condition. And the belief condition would be the target condition. And notice now, they're not, the subject is not watching uh, a scene unfold like this. They're reading a story here. But this story involves understanding that somebody has a false belief. 
And then the photo, this would be, again, the, uh, a story that uh, describes how a picture no longer represents the world because the world changed. So when you take the photo brain activity and subtract it from the belief brain activity, you get a high activation in the right temporal parietal junction. Now there are a set of brain areas that seem to be activated by these types of tasks, and the, the TPJ is just one of them. In fact, uh, you'll get bilateral activation of TPJ, uh, but we're going to focus on the right TPJ. There's uh, also the temporal pole is often activated for these kinds of tasks, and uh, as well as the medial prefrontal cortex, the posterior cingulate cortex, and the precuneus. Now, we'll just briefly mention the medial prefrontal here. It shows high activity um, to stories with just people or social relationships. Uh, not, it doesn't show activity for stories about photographs or physical interactions or temporal changes. So, uh, we can think of the medial prefrontal as being turned on by uh, stimuli that involve people or social relationships. Uh, but the right temporal parietal junction shows more specificity. It shows a high response only when the story describes someone else's thoughts and beliefs, right? Now, you often get uh, co-activity of these regions because lots of stories, of course, if they involve thoughts about people, they involve people having the thoughts, right? So you'll get co-activity of these uh, regions in lots of tasks that study mentalizing. But we're going to focus on the uh, temporal parietal junction. Now here's a, a study where Sachs and her colleagues, they uh, had people read just different types of stories. One uh, st set of stories was about just the appearance of somebody. Mark was tall and thin, etc. Another set of stories were about sensations. So Sheila skipped breakfast because she was late for the train. By the time she got off the train, she was starving, so her stomach was rumbling. So these are just sensations that a person is having. And then another set of stories about thoughts. When Todd arrived outside his door, he heard voices inside. At first, he thought someone was in the room. Then he heard a laugh track, and then he realized he must have left his TV on. Right. So we're, we're reading a story about somebody's thinking process. Sure enough, if we look at the fMRI data over here, and let's just focus on the right temporal parietal junction for now, um, the stories that involve thoughts show an increase in activity as the subjects read those stories. When they read stories about bodily sensations or appearance, uh, we don't get activity here. So again, just another kind of task that shows selectivity. The right temporal parietal junction is selectively activated when the stories involve someone's thoughts. And here's just a, a slide kind of showing, again, the location of the right temporal parietal junction. And the signal for the thoughts is, uh, is much greater than for the stories about physical um, appearances or the sensations that people have. So what does the right temporal parietal junction do? Uh, well, Sachs argues that it may be encoding aspects of someone's thoughts, especially when they're different from our own. Now, you'll recall that the, if we think about the face area, what is it doing? Well, neurons there are encoding uh, different faces, right? And so the suggestion here is, is that in a similar way, uh, the TPJ, the right TPJ, is encoding thoughts. These are unobservable, but nevertheless, they're going to be represented by uh, activity in this brain region.